I'm Alan McDaniel, and I want to welcome you once again, in the wonderful name of Jesus Christ, to our Bible study here at Bible Talk. We're continuing on in our study, an in-depth study of the Sermon on the Mount. And uh, this is our 17th week in this study, and we're going to pick up where we left off in the fifth chapter of the Gospel of Matthew, and we left off in the 40th verse I want to, before we do that, I want to remind you that all of the previous studies are available here on BibleTalk.com. So if you've missed any, you can go back and watch them. If you want to invite others to go see them, they're there and they will be up throughout this study, which at the rate we're going will last uh, roughly until Jesus comes back. So don't you worry about that. I'm joined this evening, as usual, by my lovely wife, Alice. And our brother Mark, Mark, why don't you just lead us in a little prayer now to get this Bible study off the ground. Oh, oh Lord, just we thank you for having us come together tonight. Yes, yes. And just, Lord, we want to hear your yes. word yes. and get it so we can apply it to our lives, yes, Lord. Yes. And without a word, let us be a witness for others. Amen. 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 That gets us high off the ground in the heavenly places. Yes. All right, we're, we're continuing on, as I said, in this study of the most radical sermon ever preached. Preached by Jesus Christ, teaching us, training us in living life righteously. And we're in a part that I said was where we're really beginning to get radical, right? We, as I said, we left off uh, in Matthew 5.40. And not to, just as a little bit of a recap, let me just say this. It says, if anyone wants to sue you and take your shirt, let him have your coat also. And we talked about this starting, the whole Sermon on the Mount started with this statement by Jesus, blessed are the poor in spirit. And we taught about, and you can go back and look at this, those who recognize that nothing belongs to them. Not a thing. Because everything belongs to the Lord. As David said in the Psalms, the earth is the Lord's and all it contains, the fullness thereof. So when it talks about your shirt and coat, well, really, whose shirt, whose coat? Whose house? Whose anything? It all belongs to the Lord. And the blessings come when you begin to understand that everything belongs to the Lord, and all he has done is entrusted us with stewardship over what we have in our possession, right? And we have to get that attitude to be free from the burden of ownership. Okay. So to continue on in Matthew 5, 41, Jesus said, whoever forces you to go one mile, go with him too. Now, let me ask you when they say, when he says, when they force you to go one mile, what, that wouldn't be somebody just asking you to take them somewhere. I, I, I heard that they had a mile marker outside all the cities. And when a Roman soul, soldier was in transit and he had to go from one place to the other and, would, and he would stay inside these cities, that he could commandeer and tell a person, a, a young boy in that city, to take my back pack okay, well, for a um, mile. That's basically right, mm -hmm. but it's not a young boy. The, ro the, 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 the government, the officials of the government, could require of anybody at any time that you go in and, and do something in their service. Okay? So, yes, the Roman soldiers, for example, could require you, but there were limitations on it that they, that they had put on it to try and make it reasonable. So he said, if they force you to go one mile, well, then you volunteer, go, go two. Go two miles. Ah, okay. And I heard okay. it said one time, when you go the first mile, you go because you have to. When well, you go the second mile, you go because you're a friend That's, of his. Well, not, no, not no. because you're a friend. It has because nothing. you're told to do so. It's because the word says okay. to do this is That's what the whole point of this is. This is not about what is just or right in our eyes or in the eyes of the world. Mm -hmm. That's why this is so radical. Right. 
And this is why this is why Jesus is getting to this heart of the matter. Listen, I can go back. I'm going to. I, I know I've shared this before, but I think the mo- one of the most striking passages in Scripture is where Paul writes to the church at Philippi. You know, his, his letter to the Philippians, and he says. And this is in the second chapter of Philippians. He says, have the same attitude, the same mind in you that was in Christ Jesus. Not considering being equal with, with God a thing to be grasped, he emptied himself for our sake. He was obedient to death, even death on a cross. What Jesus is talking about here, when he said, don't resist an evil person. Mm-hmm. When he talks about if somebody wants your coat, give him your shirt too. Mm-hmm. He is talking about an act of voluntary love and grace, because what we are is we are the carriers of God's grace. Grace is not deserved. Grace isn't done because it's the law. Grace is done because it is the gift of God. And since we bring the knowledge of the presence of Christ Jesus into every place, that's our ministry, Paul says to the Corinthians, then part of this is that we offer our love, not because it's deserved, not because it's required, but because it is the way of God, because love gives. Yes. Okay. Okay. This is because and this is what astounds the world. You know, I've said oftentimes, we need the church is not astounding the world. Not at all. Not at all. We're not acting well, like they, the world. They may be astounding the world, but no. not in the right way. Well, it doesn't astound them anymore because they're, they're, we're doing <laughs> too, too often them. what is the same things that the world is doing. But it's the fruit of the Holy Spirit in your life. Paul's writing to the Galatians in Galatians chapter 5 that we have a love that the world doesn't have. And, you know, you'll see that here. Jesus talking about, listen, even the tax collectors, they love those who love them, but we're to love those who don't love us. We're to love our enemies. We're to love those who persecute us. This is all commentary on the Beatitudes. And it takes humility. That's what Paul talks about in second in, in Philippians chapter two. He is talking about the humility of Jesus Christ. He humbled himself, is what it says. And if Christ humbled himself, we are supposed to humble ourselves. And when you give anything, when you give your shirt, when you give your coat, when you give your house, when you give your car, when you give any of your possessions, when you give your time, when you give yourself, you're not giving anything that belongs to you because you were purchased with a price. You belong to the Lord God Almighty. You are extending to these people what belongs to God. And what God is trying to do is give them, express his grace and his love to these people. So yes, they can require you to go one. You've accomplished nothing because if they require a sinner to go one, he's going to go one. You do something other. You go beyond that because that's when it starts to be the grace of God at work in and through your life. And this is ever so important. This is what makes us so radical. The church is acting worldly because we have been acting worldly for almost 2,000 years. And we act, you know, we act these ways, oh, mumble, grumble. Do it. Now, I'm going to say this once, and I'll probably wind up saying it again. As a matter of fact, remind me if I forget to say it again. These are hard teachings. We talked last week, and I mentioned it in John chapter 6. Many of the disciples of Jesus Christ stopped following him because his teaching was too difficult. That's John 6, 6, 6, by the way. His teaching is difficult. It is horrifically difficult to the flesh, to the natural man. And, And what happens so often is that when Jesus says something as radical as this, don't resist an evil person, what we do is we start to tweak it. We start to get theological. We start to examine it. I've got to read this in the Greek and see what he really meant. Mm-hmm. You know what he really meant? Don't resist an evil person. When he says if somebody requires you to go one mile, go two, you know what it says? What he means in the Greek, what he means in the Aramaic, what he means in the Hebrew, what he means in, in the Italian, in the French. And he means do it. There's a, a, there's a verse in the Gospel of John. John 717. I'm going to... Let me, what does John 717 say? You'll bear with this, won't you? Yes. 
says, if any man is willing to do his will, he shall know of the teaching, whether it is of God or whether I speak from myself. Absolutely. Jesus said, you know, a lot of people have difficulty. Oh, it's hard to understand. Mm -hmm. It's not hard to understand. It gets very difficult to understand if you're not willing to do it. That's right. If you don't have a heart that is willing to do these difficult things with Jesus, then all of a sudden it becomes fuzzy. All of the teaching becomes fuzzy. But if your heart is to obey the word of God, without that question, all of a sudden it all becomes perfectly Very clear, clear to you. Right. It's like little kids. Mm -hmm. I mean, you ever see, really, especially little Calvin and Hobbes type boys. Take a little boy that's six years old and mommy says, it's, I have some ice cream over here in the kitchen. That kid could be sitting under the roar of an engine. He could be sitting 190 feet away. Mommy says, I have ice cream for you. Bam, there. You heard that. Let, let the mother shout at the top of her lungs, it's time to go to bed. <laughs> I wonder what she means. <laughs> I wonder if she means right now. I wonder if she really means. I wonder if she knows and... And all of a sudden, all of these, you know, you start to question because you don't want to do, do it. it. That's right. The teaching of God is simple. These are simple answers for very complex times. And these are indeed complex times. But it becomes very simple when you have a willingness to obey Jesus Christ. I was just thinking that the cross of Christ it enabled or freed God to give salvation to the world, to the people of the world. The only way or they, to me, yes. The only way they can see that is if it, it says, "Pick up your cross daily to follow Christ." That's the way the world can see Christ That's now. Right. That right. is the way that the world That's sees so Christ good. right now. It, it is by our. Let me say, we saw the love of God the Father. For God so loved the world. That was me. That was you. That was you. That was you. We saw this love because he gave his only son, Jesus Christ. And he chose to be vulnerable. It's, it says that better, in, in Proverbs, it says, better is an open rebuke than love unspoken. You have to demonstrate your love. It's not enough to say you have it. You have to demonstrate the love. And we demonstrate love by this giving, giving of ourselves. You know, it's not a matter of you don't send me flowers anymore. Yeah. If that's not a, remember I, I said what we're studying right now, this section of the Sermon on the Mount, I said, this is about the heart of the matter. Yes. It's not about the action. It's about the heart that drives right. the action. It's about yeah, the heart searching. that generates the action. Mm -hmm. And we have, listen to me. If you have no Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, then remember what Paul wrote in Romans chapter 5. He says that that love, the love of God, has been poured into your heart through his Holy Spirit. So it's there. It is there. So now it needs to express God's love through your life by what you give. And only we can release them. Well, you sure have the power to hold it back. Which is why Paul again writes, don't stifle the Holy Spirit. Mm -hmm. We have to be careful about quenching, stifling the Holy Spirit, as he wrote to the Thessalonians. Mm -hmm. We have to have that willingness to express our love by giving. Giving how much? I mean, hey, come on. How much? Empty himself. Everything. All of it. It says he emptied himself. I, I know I've shared this before. Mm -hmm. I said, you know, I had this, I had this experience. I'm going to share it again. Sure. I wasn't going to. Alice and I were over, and I was teaching Bible studies in Lyon in France a number of years ago. And I was there with a group of Africans. Uh, and during the course of this Bible study, and I don't know where this came out of, but one of the fellows at the Bible study said to me, why doesn't the church in America, because these people are desperately in need. Yes. All right. They said, why doesn't the church in America do more to help us? And I popped back an answer and said, because we don't care. Now, I repented of that right away because it says be quick, you know, to listen, be slow to speak. And I think I spoke, I, I spoke a little quickly. So I, I drew back and I repented of that. And I said, that answer was not correct. It's because we don't care enough. That answer is correct. 
So that night we went back to this little little village where we were staying, just outside of Lyon. And I prayed and I asked the Lord, well, how much is enough? How much is enough? And the Lord led me to that passage in Philippians. Have the same attitude in you that was in Christ Jesus who emptied himself. If you have anything left, you haven't given it all. You haven't given it all. And God can require it all. Because nobody can follow him and be his disciple unless they give up all. That's what it says in the Gospel of Luke. That's what Jesus said in the Gospel of Luke. You don't own anything. You don't own anything. That's radical. That happens to be the Gospel. That happens to be the simple teaching of Jesus Christ. And I'm going to tell you something. When you get this solid in your heart, you will find that it is liberating. Yes. It is freeing when you understand that. Because yeah. it takes off that burden of trying to hold it and protect it yourself. And that's what I said you know, last week. What this is about is God is calling us to get away from self-defense. He is the defense of your life. You're precious in his sight. He'll take care of what's his and you're his. But you have to believe that. It's a simple truth expressed over and over and over through Scripture. Are you a Bible believer? I know most people who say they are. It gets a little fuzzy at times. And there are Christians that can can say, "Oh, I would give I give it all to Jesus. I give it all." But God is searching their heart, and He knows whether or not. Oh, I know. It's not just you know they're not just saying this, right. but He knows in their heart. Are they are they really right. really going to do it, or would they do it? I can. Uh, I tell you one thing. This passage we're right here from thirty eight to four forty two would eliminate office politics oh, wait a minute. No. forever. It would, well, it would eliminate all strife. Everything. Yes. It would eliminate all strife. But, the, you know, I don't, I don't want to get, I'm getting, well, it's not distracted because this is a Bible study, okay? I mean, the Bible is what we're studying. Uh, it's just it's just the idea that you, you'll never be reconciled to other men until you are reconciled, truly reconciled to God. If your relationship with the Father is not right, and it can only be right through the atoning work of Jesus Christ right. and obedience to the word of Jesus Christ. Right. Remember, he said, if you love me, keep my commandments. That's the only possibility you have to have a right relationship with other people. Mm -hmm. And if you do not have a right relationship with the Lord, I promise you, yeah. you will not, you cannot have a right relationship with people. Right. It'll fail. I, I think I, I said this either not not too long ago, last week, a couple of weeks ago. Alice and I were getting I'm getting ready for this trip and we we're looking at some new luggage. Uh, ours is well worn. And we were talking to a couple of young ladies at a <coughs> luggage store. And <laughs> as it turns out, talk about Jesus. I like to talk about Jesus. And one of the young ladies, all of a sudden, I mean, she asked me, you know, I, how hard, she starts talking about how difficult it is to find real to love. find real love, and I said to her, and I'm, I'm, don't, "This is not an exact quote, but the gist of it was: unless you find a man who loves the Lord, you will never find anybody who knows how to love you." And, and young ladies, if you're out there and listening to this, I promise you, you need to understand this. If you if you if you engage yourself in a relationship. With a man who doesn't love the Lord, he'll never love you right. And that, guys, he can't. That, he can't. And guys, the, the, the obverse of that is, is true also. You know, I say one of the greatest gifts that I have is Alice. Alice and I, as of tonight, I, if I, what day is it? We have been married for 40, today's the 27th. So we have been married for 44 years, seven months, and three days. And I say the greatest gift that God has given me outside of salvation is Alice. And what makes Alice such a great gift in my life is she loves Jesus more than she loves me. And that's all right. Because if she didn't love Jesus as much as she does, she wouldn't be able to love me as much as she does. That's right. Okay, let's go on with this, okay? Okay, okay. Okay, okay. In, in verse 42, Jesus goes on and says, Give to him who asks of you and do not turn away from him who wants to borrow from you. Right, now that's... Uh... That one's radical. That one gets you, huh? Well, the other I'm one. I'm just thinking. No, no. I'm just thinking how that you people who want to borrow. That's. I think that's one of the things that people don't like. 
Of course they don't. Borrowing from them. Especially when you can't charge interest. I Especially when you can't that. even expect it in the back. <laughs> that, well, that was the... Uh, well, he, this would open you up to be abused. Oh, well. Yes. You have you're a problem? Wait, 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 stop, Alex. And you have a problem with this? <laughs> See, that is the, the problem. problem. Over and over and over. What stops us from living these words of Jesus Christ is you will be abused. The fact of the matter is, Jesus Christ was abused. He took the abuse. He was. And we need to be prepared to follow him down that road. But you have nothing to lose that belongs to you. That's why I say this Sermon on the Mount, you know, I said this, if you go back, you know, I did an introduction and in the second week we looked at the first beatitude, blessed are the poor in spirit. And it is so important to understand this. Because understanding that nothing is yours opens the gateway for you to understand, truly understand, that Jesus Christ is Lord. That he is master of it all because it all belongs to him. So he has the right to say to you, give this to him, give that to them, let them take this, let them do this. Because it's his, not yours. But if you don't understand that, you'll always have a problem and you're always worried about being abused. You want to know something? At the end of the matter is better than its beginning. You may be abused here in this world if you look at it in a worldly, worldly way. But we are called to appraise all things spiritually. And what you, if you are trying to protect, I'll put quotes around this, if you are trying to protect what is yours, you have lost sight of what is important in this situation. You know what's important? That other person's eternal soul. And that's what Jesus is concerned with. He is not concerned with the money. He is not concerned with you being abused that way. He is not concerned with your life because your life is secure for all eternity. Well, can you run into a problem here and now? Absolutely. But what is important at the moment in any situation is the well the eternal well-being of that other person the roman soldier who requires you to go a mile what's important is not whether you're getting just treatment what is important is he, his eternal well-being if somebody comes and wants to borrow from you you are supposed to share the eternal treasures that god has given you with that person the cash doesn't really matter you know we lived in belize as a matter of fact mark was down there with us for a while we lived as missionaries in the bush out in belize and there, there's so much petty theft or there was when we lived there. This is going back now 20 years. It has to have gotten worse. Well, that's an assumption on your part, but I'll, I'll live with that. It wouldn't surprise me if it's gotten worse. But the point was, I used to say to people, you know, these people, they're, they want to steal my junk. I came here to give them my treasure. Mm -hmm. And until you understand that you have a treasure, and the treasure is not your wallet, the treasure is not your car. The treasure is not your house. The treasure is not your job. The treasure that you have is the love of God that's important to your heart. Paul said we are earthen vessels filled with a treasure. What we need to do is start fixing our minds on the well-being of others instead of on ourselves. The danger is that you become self or that you become more and more self-centered. Paul said to Timothy in you know, 2 Timothy chapter 3, he said, in the last days, perilous times will come because men will be lovers of self. In giving, one of the things that I think that gives people joy is the, the um, attitude of the people that are receiving. Well, you know, if you, if you are a Bible believer, no, I'm not, I didn't say if you go to church. Mm -hmm. I didn't say if you listen to sermon. I said if you actually believe the Word of God, then you will believe the words of Jesus Christ when he said it's more blessed to give than to receive. And if you're not finding it a blessing to give, you better get in your prayer closet and get back in touch with the Lord because something is wrong. Now, I know that there are a lot of people out there that are trying to take what you consider to be yours. And I know that you will find situations where God says, don't give this person, because you know, I, work with me here a minute. There are many times in scriptures when somebody comes up 
and, and ask Jesus Christ a question. And he immediately answers something entirely different. <laughs> nothing, it doesn't seem like it has anything to do with the situation. Right? I mean, you see that over and over in yes. Scripture. Yeah. There have been times when people have come up to, to, uh, to me and to us, and somebody would ask me, I, one of the most memorable cases was um, when I was pastor of a church in New York, we had gone up to New Hampshire. We were in Laconia, New Hampshire. Mm -hmm. And this gentleman came up. I say gentleman because I'm being gracious. This stinky old bummy guy came up to us and said, you know, give me some money. Panhandling. Now, am I being obedient to the word of Jesus Christ? I refuse to give him money. But I did say, I, what I want to do is take you and buy you breakfast. breakfast. Because I saw the need. Right. The need wasn't for money. The, and the need was not for money because the money would have... And, and I trusted it was the Spirit of God that led us to say, I want to meet your need. I want to take you and I want to give you a decent meal and we'll sit with you and talk with you. Because you want to know something? It's much easier, much, much easier in the natural, to the flesh, to hand a guy a buck and be on your way and forget about him. But we chose to take this man and take him to a restaurant and sit with him for over an hour and buy him breakfast and sit there and share the word of God with him, the love of God with him, and that, that man. And then find a place for him. And then find a place for him. That man got saved that morning. Yes, he did. That man on the street. Yes. Right on the street. But that man is not the same man. You want to know something? And even after he knelt down in the middle of the street with Alice and I and prayed to receive Jesus Christ as his Lord and his Savior, he still stunk. Yes, he did. He was still filthy yes, he was. on the outside. Mm -hmm. But not on the inside anymore. We need to start focusing on others instead of focusing on ourselves. That's the heart of the matter. That's what Jesus is dealing with here. He is trying to teach us. And I've said this. I'm going to say it over and over and over through this. He has just called his apostles. He has just, this is the first major sermon that Jesus preaches. He is training, as Paul says, all scripture is God breathed and profitable for training in righteousness. He has given us the gift of righteousness. He has restored us to a right relationship with the Father. Now, the Sermon on the Mount is training us to live righteous. They already know how to live religious. And that's what most of this part of the Sermon on the Mount is about. Stop living what looks religious and start living what is righteous. Don't blow horns and tithe so people see you and give you glory. But if somebody asks you, give them the love of God out of your heart. And this just reminds me, too, of when, when you were pastoring in, uh, here in Florida, that so many times people would come because they had needs. Absolutely. And we would never turn them away. No. And even, even if there was a, an inkling that you know, they really didn't need it or something, you would always say, it would, I, would I would rather write, make yeah. the mistake in giving than in holding back. Yes, I would, if I'm going to make a mistake, yeah. I would rather give when I shouldn't. Then withhold when I should have given. Yes. Yeah. Okay. So anyhow, let, you know, Paul says, let a man examine himself to see if he's in the faith here. You got, you got to start thinking about this. If you just come and listen to this Bible study and, and blow it away, think about what, not what I'm saying. This think, is taking some soul searching. Think about what Jesus is saying and examine yourself. Yeah. Say, where's your heart? Are you protecting what's yours? Or are you giving out what's his? Because your purpose in this life is that you bring a word of reconciliation, trying to reconcile men to God, men and women and children to God the Father. That's your mission, your ministry here in this life. It's not about accumulating more stuff, getting a better job, getting a nicer car, getting a bigger house. It's not about that. Your ministry, your mission here in this life is to bring the knowledge of the presence of Christ Jesus into every place. That's the word of God. And here is Jesus' instruction on how you do that. Be prepared to lose. You're gonna, yeah, we're going to get there sometime, all right? Mm -hmm. Let's just go on. So the next thing he says, he said, You have heard that it was said, You shall love your neighbor and hate your enemy. But I say to you, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you so that you may be sons of your Father who is in heaven. 
For he causes the sun to rise on the evil and the good, and sends rain on the righteous and the unrighteous. For if you love those who love you, what reward do you have? Do not even the tax collectors do the same. If you greet only your brothers, what more are you doing than others? Do not even the Gentiles do the same. You know, there's the interesting parable that Jesus told, the story he told, about what we call the Good Samaritan. That was in response to a question, who is my neighbor? Because the Jews and the Samaritans did not get along. And yet here's this Jew in need, and a Samaritan comes along and takes care of him. Right? Who's your neighbor? Whoever you're in contact with. It's not the guy that lives next door. It's the guy who lives next door in the world. It's whoever you come in contact with. And you've got to love them, regardless of how worthy they are of your love. Regardless of how deserving they are of your love. Regardless of how nice they are to you. Because if that was the criteria, you want to know something? You wouldn't be at a Bible study, you'd be out at a bar or something tonight. Because you never would have received the love of God. Had he not be willing to give you his love when you did not deserve it. When you were his enemy. The word of God says this. We know love by this. And if he you're loved a us. Of the world, you're an no. enemy of God. We hated him. We were an en- We were enemies That's of God, right. and yet he loved us and went to the cross in our place. That's what demonstrates. That's what. That's what shows what love is. Mm-hmm. I am sickened by the actions that I have seen in the church, broad mm-hmm. church, big brush here. I'm painting with. In the last couple of years, yes. in in relationship to what has gone on in the world with terrorism. Yes. I'm going to tell you now, I was never a fan of Osama bin Laden. I was never a fan of any of the terrorists. I was never... Gaddafi? He was a leader of a country. Saddam Hussein? Yeah, he's still... He he, he was... shot. No, you're right. Okay, I'm sorry. Yeah, he was kicked out of office there, or kicked by a rebellion in Libya, and then shot, cold-blooded murder. Saddam Hussein, I'm not a fan of his, uh, Osama bin Laden. But to see Christians dancing in the street and celebrating over their death. It says in Proverbs, do not rejoice when an enemy stumbles. When your enemy falls, yes. Uh, so they were not obedient to that particular thing. I, I, again, you know, I'm asking this question. Are you a Bible believer? Do you believe that God means it when he says, don't rejoice when your enemy falls? Why? Now, the world can do that. That's between, you know, listen, I'm not talking about the world. I'm talking about you. I'm talking about me. Why? Because here is the heart of the Father. Paul says we have the mind of Christ. I often wonder, do we actually have the heart of the Father? Who desires that none should perish, but all come to a saving knowledge of him. Come to that salvation, right? So if Saddam Hussein did not hear the gospel, if he, well, I'm sure you're somewhere along the line you heard the gospel. He probably yeah, you can't I, leave until you have. Yeah. The point is, I would like to see people come to life in Jesus Christ. Now, it doesn't mean that they won't suffer the consequences of their guilty actions. That is indeed the ministry of the world. We talked about this last week. The governors have been given the sword by the Lord God Almighty to punish evildoers. Mm -hmm. And that's why we are supposed to be apart from the world. Because our ministry is to bring the love of God praying, desiring with all of our being that that person gets saved. How many Christians do you think prayed? Here in America, how many Christians do you think prayed for Osama bin Laden? How many Christians prayed for Saddam Hussein when he was on trial facing execution? How many? How many Christians prayed for Gaddafi, Muammar Muammar Gaddafi, when when his life was being threatened during the midst of that rebellion? You don't pray for them? The Word of God says we are to pray for our enemies. Then you weren't doing what Jesus said. Talk to me, a Bible believer. If you don't do what Jesus said, you're not a Bible believer. Jesus said, if you love me, keep my commandments. 
Your job, your job, my job, our job, is to be praying for the lost, for these dirty, rotten sinners who have no goodness in them at all. Now, you know, let the world deal with them as evildoers. But our job is to bring them the message of mercy and grace and salvation from Jesus Christ. If you don't believe that, close your Bible right now, leave this Bible study, and go turn on one of those stupid, sinful television shows. Because yeah. you're wasting your time here. Mm. You, you know what? You're better off not hearing it. Yeah, that's true, because you're responsible for it. If you're, if you're not going to do it, if you're not here to hear the Word of God so that you do the Word of God, you better be, you had better watch your step. Because you're responsible. Because it is not the hearers of the Word, but the doers of the Word. We have to, you know, we're making a commitment to be here to, to be in the Word of God so that we gain instruction on how we should be living our life. I don't care what you think of what Jesus said here. I most assuredly don't care what you think about what I'm saying. But I do care that you be, that you understand that he, Jesus is saying these things. He expects us to be obeying these things. And if they haven't prayed for these enemies, there's still opportunity because there's still a lot of them out there. A lot of them out there. That's and by the way, pray for. Let, me, let me make this clear in case you have any questions about this. Praying for them, loving them, yeah. does not mean that you have to agree with their, with their actions. Absolutely not, no. You okay, so it's not your a heart. Your prayers, your love for them is not a stamp of approval of no, what they're doing. Not at all, not at all. And the same thing is true of, of the Lord. Mm -hmm. He doesn't, yeah, he doesn't. He can love you without approving of what you're doing. That's right. And you better be thankful for that. Hallelujah. I'll tell you what. Because you're not there yet. Where yet? Perfect yet. We'll get, we'll get to that. But the fact of the matter is he loves us in spite of that. And he, he can love us without approving of the things that we do wrong. So can you. You can love those people without it being an approval of what they're doing. Amen. Now, will the world hate you for that? Of course yes. they will. Will most of the church chide you? Will most of the church reject you for doing that? Certainly they will. The question then becomes, who cares? It says, show yourself approved unto God. I want to please the Father. A workman. Rightly dividing the word of truth. You have to set your mind on pleasing the Lord, not pleasing men. Okay. That brings us to verse 48. Therefore, you are to be perfect as your heavenly Father is perfect. Well, that was Jesus. Oh, well, you know, I'm just a baby Christian. Oh, well. Excuses. Excuses, Excuses are, come on now, the fiery arrows shot from the pits of hell to kill repentance. As long as you make excuses, you'll never repent. What's the first rule of sharpshooting? Pull the trigger, aim, pull the No, trigger. you have to aim at the target. Because if you don't aim at the target, how do you know your sights are off? How do you know if you're doing stuff wrong? Okay. You can't get correct feedback right. to, to improve. This has to be your goal. You know, Paul, I, I don't think that there are many men who have lived as faithfully to the Word of God as the Apostle Paul did, mm. right? And yet, near the end of his life, he said he hadn't achieved perfection yet. But I promise you, he was striving, striving for it. So what you're saying, I understand, we need to be striving for perfection. God, does, does God demand it? He demands that it be your heart. Yes. This is the heart of the matter. He demands that it be your heart's desire, that perfection be your heart's desire. Will you fail in doing that? Of course you will. But thank God that if we do fail, we can go before him and we can confess that. And that is a sin when we fail. Though, I mean, to sin means missing the mark, falling short of the mark. But if we confess our sin, it says that he is faithful and righteous to forgive our sin. He's not hang waiting. You know, I went through this in the religion I grew up in as a kid. You know, it's like God is there with a great big hammer just waiting for any opportunity to bonk you on the head. He is not. 
He is the loving parent who's always there, and he watches the child, and that child, you know the child's going to fall when they're learning how to walk. So does the parent start hollering and screaming at him? Not if he's like, not if he has the love of God in him. You pick him up, you dust him off, and you go back on the way, right? So, yes, but the words of Jesus Christ are, here, be perfect, even as your Father in heaven is perfect. All right, now, explain how, what that perfect is. It's the Sermon on the Mount, baby. It's living the Sermon on the Mount. What, what we have just seen is, Jesus has said, here's the way I expect you to live, because this is perfection. This is the perfect Christian. This is the perfect Christian, because this is Jesus Christ. And he's saying, okay, do this. Now I've told you this, do this. Now, you know, a couple of years back, Alice and I were, we do, we do a lot of traveling, ministering and everything. And we were out in the Dallas area in Texas. And we went to a mega church in the suburbs of Dallas. Yes. yes. And the, we were there by invite of, of some family, as a matter of fact. And the pastor, they do a couple of services a day. It's a big church. Big audiences. Yes, I said. Audiences. I said That's audience. Exactly what they are. And pardon? Oh, so, okay, okay. And he stood up, and I was a little bit shocked when he admitted that the sermon that he was about to preach, mm. he had not purchased online from sermons.com. So I guess that's his normal practice. And I really told him about this one just yeah. before he came in. Yes. That's what, and that's, what, that's what he said, right? So that troubled me a little bit. And then he got up and he started talking about how wrong it is to be a perfectionist. How wrong it is, how wrong it is to strive for perfection. Because then you'll feel guilty when you don't when you don't achieve it. And he preached for 35 minutes yeah, or half an hour. Uh, yes. Yeah. yes. Uh, if you miss what Al said, it was like, okay, if, if you strive for perfection and you don't achieve it, that'll hurt your self-esteem. Yes. So I, I don't guess it was maybe 30, 30 minutes, 20 to 30 minutes he yeah. preached his sermon. Mm -hmm. And his whole message was, don't try and be perfect. And of course, he, this is a, a mega church, so all of the people there, they're there, and they're just, they're waving, cheering, and clapping, and having a grand old time. And I went up to him afterwards, and I said, you are aware, I'm sure, that Jesus Christ said, mm -hmm. you are to be perfect, even as your Father in heaven is perfect. Because he had just preached exactly the opposite of what Jesus had said in the Sermon on the Mount. It sounded it was, nice. Oh, and it was very well received. Yeah, yeah, it sounded nice. And he said something to me to the effect of, oh, it's nice to see people with such a zeal for the word. Mm -hmm. Now, thankfully, because of the love of God that is in my heart, I didn't punch the guy in the nose, especially in front of all these people. Not because I was worried they would have killed me, but it's just not the godly thing to do, don't you know? Though I was tempted. I was mightily tempted. I would have said something like uh, oh, his lack of zeal. No, 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 I'm not, I'm not, I'm not I, wasn't there, I wasn't there to accuse him. Right. There to encourage him? No, that was an encouragement. That was there for correction. Yeah. And no other reason. I, I quoted before from, from Paul's letter to second, the second letter to Timothy. He said, we're all scripture is God breathed and profitable. It's profitable for reproof and for correction. And that man needs correction. When he can stand up and have all of these people there and say, wow, boy, this is a special message because he didn't buy it. And his message is don't try to be perfect because it'll hurt your self-esteem. That man needs correction. And sadly, I would say that all of those people there, they need correction because they are not testing what he is saying according to the word of God. That's what Paul said about the church at Berea. He said the Bereans were more noble-minded and everything because they tested everything that Paul taught to make sure it lined up with the scriptures. Oh, pray God that more and more Christians would start testing what they hear. Test what you hear against the word of God and make sure that it is the word of God. And if it is not the word of God, go in love and correct them. I don't care who they are. I don't care what yeah. their title is. Don't I don't care who you are. I don't care if you've been a Christian for 37 minutes and you hear a sermon and it you say, whoa, that doesn't look like it. Go talk to them about it. We need to start dealing with these things because these are the last days when, when people will accumulate for themselves teachers who teach according to their own desires. They won't endure sound doctrine. Second Timothy chapter four. 
And what's happening is, what a nice message. Your pastor has just told you, don't worry. You don't have to worry about being perfect. You don't have to worry about even striving to be perfect. As a matter of fact, it's not a good thing to be striving to be perfect. So you're free to be a sloppy it, Christian. It, it, so we ought to strive to be perfect, but no, we can't attain it. Well, if you you know what? If you, are, if you are truly, if it is your heart's desire and you are striving to be perfect, strive if it is your desire, if it is your heart's desire to do the things that Jesus has spoken, if it is your heart because of your love for Jesus Christ to obey his commandments, and by the way, nothing here in the Sermon on the Mount is a suggestion. It's all the commandments of God. All right? And it's by the power of the Holy Spirit that we would be able to. Of course to you can. You, so, couldn't, you couldn't do it on your own. Yeah, we but, can. But, but the fact of the matter is, I mean, you know, if you don't set your goal to be perfect, mm -hmm. then you just you become mediocre. And your Christianity will be mediocre. And there's great, great danger in that. So when you are striving for a goal, and this is what Paul says, he ran the race, right? Mm -hmm. He had a goal. When you are striving, and you, you want to know something? That goal is the vision that God gives you. And the vision that you should have, the vision that should excite you, is God working within you. Because I'm going to tell you something. I can look in the mirror and I see me as I am. I can look in the Word of God and see me as how I'm going to be. Because it says, when I see Jesus Christ face to face, eyeball to eyeball, I am going to be as he is. Because God's purpose, plan, and promise is that before the foundations of the earth, he predestined me to be conformed into the image of his son, Christ Jesus. And that, my friend, is perfection. And that is is my future. That is my forecast. One we way or the other, because, because he is the potter and I am the clay. I am the work of his hands. What he has begun in my life, he is able to complete in my life. It is just about my heart's desire to be obedient and surrender myself to him and let him work his work in me. But it comes from surrendering to God and making him the Lord of your life and not making excuses about why you cannot, should not, or will not do the things that he has commanded in the Sermon on the Mount. You know, I said, last week I talked about jury duty, right? Yes. Let, me, let me really get into some un-American activities here. Uh-oh. Everything that Jesus has taught here is considered by the vast majority of the church in the United States to be very un-American. That's true. Mm -hmm. It is. Yeah, that's true. Okay. Indeed it is. I want to read you the verse. John 18, 35 and 36. Pilate answered, right? And said to Jesus at his cry, I am not a Jew, am I? Your own nation and the chief priests delivered you to me. What have you done? And Jesus answered, my kingdom is not of this world. If my kingdom were of this world, then my servants would be fighting so that I would not be handed over to the Jews. But as it is, my kingdom is not of this realm. Paul wrote to in Philippians, Philippians 3.20, he said, our citizenship is in heaven, from which also we eagerly wait for a savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. If you were of the world, you'd be fighting. But we are citizens of the kingdom of God, not this world. All right? Is that clear? This is not the kingdom we are citizens of. This is not the kingdom we are citizens of. And this is as it should be scripturally, but not for the Christian whose ministry is not judgment, but grace and mercy and reconciliation to God Almighty. All right? That's what we are supposed to be. Okay, I, I want to get into this a little bit, and this is dangerous ground. Hopefully I, I made myself some notes today. In, in, instead of going forward into chapter 6. Oh, I'm not going there. Oh, you are? No, 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 no. I'm not going there. I, I want to deal with this issue, all right? Because I, I'm saying that... Um, the church here in this country, and the church here in this country... 
has been influential beyond your belief. I mean, Alice and I travel the world. We go to so many places in Latin America, in, in Africa, in Europe, and they all want to be like the church in America. Yeah, yeah. And the reason they want to all be like the church in America is because we have Out sig outward success. Yes, outward success. All right. Just give me a second here. I want to get this. This is the idea of not defending yourself, of giving when, when others would say you shouldn't give. That's very un-American, right? Yes. It, it is. The very idea that we should be submissive to governing authorities at our own expense, right, mm -hmm. is, is hard to deal with because it's like, you know, are we going to be floor mats? The world doesn't love us. Yeah. Jesus said that. John said that. You know, the world hated Jesus Christ. It's going to hate us. Right. Which is why we're told, you know, that we have to be praying and blessing those who persecute us. Because the promise to God is that we're going to be persecuted in the last days. I'll go back once again to 2 Timothy chapter 3, where Paul says to his son in the faith, Timothy, that all who desire to live godly in the last days will be persecuted. All right? All of this instruction, now think about the Sermon on the Mount. I'm going to tell you where we run into such a problem. We talked about taxes. Okay. Yes. Caesar Augustus was a Caesar when Jesus Christ was born. Caesar Augustus, by the way, I'll give you a little history lesson here real quick. He's the first real emperor of Rome. Okay. Not Julius Caesar. He's a descendant of Julius Caesar, uh, in, in line with him. But he's the first one that runs an empire, okay? In order to do the projects that he had in mind, he was a very ambitious man. He had to collect a lot of taxes. Mm -hmm. So he ordered that everybody in the Roman world go back and register. He took a census to make sure he was going to get the proper taxes. That caused Mary and Joseph to travel from their home, their familial home in, in Nazareth, to go down to where the original home was in Bethlehem, mm -hmm. which of course is where Jesus was born, right? As to fulfill the prophecies mm -hmm. through the prophet Micah. Mm -hmm. right? If you look at the Caesars during the New Testament time, you will see some of the most despotic rulers mm -hmm. that the world has ever seen. Okay? Mm -hmm. Absolutely despotic. Uh, one of the nicest ones was Claudius. He was, all right, he was, mm. Claudius was preceded by Caligula. Caligula is demonic. Oh and Caligula actually calls himself a god mm. and starts wanting people to worship him. And he demands that an, a statue of himself be placed in the temple in Jerusalem just before he died. And it was his death assassinated by his own Praetorian guard that, that prevented that from occurring. I wonder if God had a hand in that, right? Yeah. God defends what is. Yes. Nero yeah. Yeah. succeeded Claudius. Oh, by the way, Claudius was a nice guy, but yet he, he brought about reform because he wanted Roman religions to thrive, mm. which is one of the reasons that he kicked all of the Jews out of Rome. And if you go into the book of Acts, you remember Priscilla and Aquila, this, they're, they're out of Rome because they, all the Jews have been kicked out of Rome. You know why? Because of the name of Christus. Because Christians were stirring things up. This is the excuse that Claudius used because they're preaching Jesus Christ, which is causing dissension between, you know, the Jews who are accepting and the Jews who are not accepting that. So he removes all of the Jews out of, out of Rome proper. He succeeded by Nero. Nero, again, a total despot. I mean, this guy is just bad, bad news. And both the secular and Christian historians record that Nero was the first emperor to institutionalize persecution of Christians. Nero. Nero. But interestingly enough, it is in the reign of Nero that Paul writes his letter to the Romans where he talks about being submissive to governing authorities. That's what Mark had mentioned last week. Mm -hmm. It is in the reign of Nero that Peter writes his first letter. 
talking about being submissive to all governing authorities. How can they say be submissive to governing authorities when, when so these evil. guys are so evil? Because the Spirit of God moved them to write such a thing. All right? Now, I, I could give you a history lesson of all of the Caesars who lived during the New Testament times, and you're going to see the same thing. But here's what I want you to think about, right? And I, I do have this note I made myself. Okay. The taxes were often oppressive during New Testament times. They were the IRS of the day, right? The tax collectors are used as examples of people who are bad and sinners in the New Testament. The tax collectors, are, these are the examples of bad guys. Remember, he, he, right here, Jesus said, for if you love those who love you, what reward do you have? Even the tax collectors do that, right? Government authorities could compel and force any person into serving them. Soldiers could impress Jewish civilians into service at any time. Right? right? Whoever forces you to go one mile. Right. The Jews of the time, this time period, the New Testament, had to endure all of this and support the government of Rome, mm. but had no say in its operation. Mm. Do you understand that what I just said? Taxation without representation. Taxation without theory. representation. The British forces impressing colonial troops. Mm. Right? These were exactly the things that the colonists said gave them the godly right to rebel yeah. against King George III. The winners get to write the history books. I'm talking about the American Revolution. If they had lost, it would have been called the Colonists' Rebellion. And I just want to tell you, the rebellion is as witchcraft. The United States of America, I'm not talking about the Puritans coming over for the first time. This nation was born in rebellion against governing authorities that were not as bad as what Paul and Peter and Jesus and James and John and Andrew and Thomas endured and went through. We're running out of time here, right? God spoke through Samuel thousands of years ago and said, rebellion is as the sin of witchcraft. Now, my purpose in bringing this up is not that so much to sit in judgment of the events of so long ago as it is to take a realistic look at our lives today and for us to consider our relationship with the world that we live in. We'll talk more about this in our next time around. I said this was going to be radical. And Father, we just thank you, Lord God. We thank you and we praise you for the liberation of your spirit. For you said that where your spirit is, there is liberty. And, and that's the liberty that we seek, we live in, and God give us the strength and power by your Holy Spirit to obey the words of your Son, Jesus Christ, and to bring your love, to bring your power, to bring the knowledge of your presence into every place that we go, that other lives might be touched by your love. Lord, use us for the glory of your name. I pray this in the name of your Son, Jesus Christ. Only by grace can we enter Only by grace